I'm here with, this is Jeffrey Tucker, Laissez Faire Books, and the Cryptocurrency Conference, and I'm here with Ben Davenport. And I must say, it's a real honor to be here with you, Ben, because you're kind of a legendary uh, web web developer <laughs> and and Bitcoin. I always feel like uh, uh, I don't know anything, you know, when when you're posting <laughs> stuff. So it's I, think, uh, I think I uh, think you're the legend, Jeff. So <laughs> I'm uh, very honored to be here. Well, thank you. So let's. Um, Let's just jump right in. You know, I, I, I read yesterday what I thought was a quite remarkable report from BBVA Compass Bank, right? They have their own research division. They put out a, a report on Bitcoin that seemed very accurate and, you know, it ends with a kind of comparison of Bitcoin to, to, to Napster, you know, a radically disruptive technology that's going to change history. What do you think about that? Uh, I mean, I think they're almost right. I think, uh, <coughs> excuse me. I think I think a better analogy would be probably to uh, BitTorrent, which was really the second generation. Uh, you know, after Napster, Napster was essentially a managed file sharing protocol, which ultimately proved to be susceptible to uh, you know lawsuits, government action, and so forth. And um, the market evolved, and we ended up with BitTorrent, which was a true peer-to-peer -peer protocol much like Bitcoin, and uh, you know, Bit BitTorrent now represents, I, I don't know the exact numbers, but probably 15, 20% of all internet traffic. So it's uh, extremely substantial. So I think, I think that's the better analogy. <clears throat> and, and in fact, I mean, even though there was a kind of government war on file sharing, there's more file sharing than, than ever before today. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't see a government war on Bitcoin right now. I think government is, is uh, kind of taking its first early steps. I think they see risks, but I think there have been a lot of good, uh, there have been a lot of good papers. At, uh, there was a paper by the uh, Jerry Brito at uh, Mercatus uh, Center at uh, George Mason uh, recently, about a 50-page document that uh, really did a good job of laying out for policymakers um, sort of, Hey, there's there's a lot of stuff you, a lot of advantages you may not have realized that uh, Bitcoin provides. It's good to take a, a measured, slow approach to figure yeah. out what the regulation would be. I read that paper <clears throat> a couple of days ago, yesterday, and I was extremely impressed by it. I mean, it's 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 really lucid. It answers a lot of the questions that policymakers might have. Uh, but, I mean, it's good for anybody to read. Uh, it's a kind of a nice introduction to Bitcoin. Can you, can you provide something like a, which you just started to do before I interrupted, uh, uh, something like how would you characterize the outlook of, of regulators towards Bitcoin? Because I, I hear this almost every day. People say, well, stop, why don't you shut up about Bitcoin because it's just going to be taken, taken down by by uh, financial regulators and, and the government. I mean, I hear this every day, and then one response is, oh, well, uh, they can't really do that because Bitcoin is too clever, it's the honey badger, you know, <laughs> right? Uh, but but what, what, what do you see as the attitude towards financial regulators and... and well, you know, I... <clears throat> sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, the, uh, you know, I, I'm not from Washington, so, you know, I don't... I don't. I don't necessarily think like uh, the regulators. Um, I've tried to sort of understand how they look at a, at a thing like this. Um, I think. I think they're. You know, regulators are always going to be in a reactive mode to new technology. That's just the nature of technology and how governments act. I think, in general, I think you know the the, the people involved are you know. They're not just racing to judgment. Um, I think they see something and they're trying to figure out, they see something new that doesn't fit their existing model of the world of how things work. The fact that they're, you know, their world, they live in a world where for thousands of, you know, hundreds of years at least, uh, you know, intermediaries have been a key uh, sort of component of doing financial transactions. And so they don't have a model of financial transactions that don't involve uh, an intermediary. Um, and so they're trying to figure out how does this round peg fit into my square hole, and how do I how do I look at this? Um, and I think they're doing it. so far. You know, the the reactions have been measured. I think 
I think, and I, the interesting thing is I think you're going to see a little bit of a, a laboratory um, across the world because there's not just one regulatory environment. Um, there's the U.S. regulatory environment. We have a different sort of regime in Canada, and they're taking a little bit less, more hands-off approach. Uh, Germany at this point is, is sort of maybe taking the most um, sort of embracing approach. They've sort of uh, explicitly categorized Bitcoin in the same bucket that they would put, say, uh, SDRs that are issued by the, uh, what is it, the IMF, I guess. Um, and then, you know, so there's there's just like a variety of, uh, of, of approaches to this. And I think, it's, I think we're going to get to see uh, for better or for worse, uh, how the how uh, you know how that affects startup activity in those countries, and you know what what are the which countries does it really start taking off in? Um, which country which countries are attracting the best startups in the space, based on how regulators are are approaching it. And Bitcoin is really a global currency, <clears throat> so we do really have a laboratory, right? Uh, people can buy from anywhere and spend to and from anywhere. Yeah, that's absolutely right, and I think the you know the the Mercatus paper made you know that good point that like it's an international phenomenon, and if if you squeeze down on it here, you're you're putting you know potentially U.S. businesses at, at competitive disadvantage to you know less less regulatory regimes, um, and they also made the very good point that um, if you the more you the more you crack down. Uh, on Bitcoin, you don't necessarily reduce the illicit use of Bitcoin. That stuff can that that, uh, that activity can still happen, but meanwhile, you crack down on the the very legitimate use of Bitcoin because you know legitimate businesses can't go near it if you make excessive regulation. So well, I think it's interesting too that in fact. If you you're planning to engage in illicit activity with with Bitcoin, why would you even use one of the exchanges? Why wouldn't you just deal peer to peer and bypass the exchange? In other words, the people who are using uh, places, these commercial services like BitPay and Coinbase and all the everything else are they're just trying to do better business, right? I mean, it's not it's not really about drugs and guns and. No, I, I don't think so. I think, yeah, I mean, I think you'd be crazy if you wanted to buy something up the Silk Road to go set up an account in Mt. Gox, you know, ID yourself, uh, and then, you know, leave a trail on the blockchain. I mean, I think I think Bitcoin is significantly less anonymous than many people think it is. Um, and I think that's actually, like, regulators are learning that. And, um, you know, I, th I think that's actually an important point uh, for governments, um, that the... While it is, it's private, but it's not really anonymous. And there's if there's a lot of uh, potential for information leakage when you're using Bitcoin. So if you're using it in in an illegal way, uh, you better be careful because that transaction record is there. It's public and it's there forever. So yeah, I think you know it's. Uh, I was so excited. And as a matter of fact, I was not really interested in Bitcoin until I figured out <clears throat> the purpose of the. Pseudonymity or uh, uh, the cryptography involved was, was not to allow people to sneak sneak around, right? I mean, the purpose of it is to is to reestablish monetary transactions as real property exchange without third party trusted agents intervening, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you can, you can make the same analogy to cryptography and just communication. Um, just because you want to maintain privacy of your private communications doesn't mean you're doing anything illicit. It just means I don't want the NSA listening. Right. You just don't want a third party. And I think, I think this is an extremely important point. And, you know, I, I thought about this earlier when you just in passing said for hundreds of years we've used third party trust agent relationships, whereas Bitcoin is peer to peer. You know, you kind of went through that really, really quickly. The, the significance of that is is something that can't be overestimated. I mean, you're talking about essentially, <clears throat> it's it's not even possible for people to sort of conceive of this. But this is the age of the internet. We need ways to exchange real property that that uh, ways that are not geographically contingent, right? So I need to be able to trade something with you. <clears throat> no matter where you are in the world. That's right. I mean, Bitcoin introduced fundamentally 
it fundamentally was the first uh, scarce digital commodity that can be traded at a distance without an intermediary, and that's you know that's fundamentally something new in the world that has never been seen. The ability to transmit value um, halfway across the world and essentially instantaneously without you know, access to an intermediary, which essentially is, it could be something like a Hawala network where you have, you know, sort of trust on both ends of, of a, you know, both ends of a Hawala network or you have the banking network. It all right. only works on the same trust principle. What, what Bitcoin allows is two individuals to do that who don't trust each other and don't need to trust a third party. And, and in practice, the, the existing... Uh, Nationalized government money system made uh, made is is functioning is made possible through through credit cards and uh, these kind of bank transfers and things like this. <clears throat> In practice, this excludes huge swaths of the world population, right? I mean, you you if you can't get to a bank or you don't have a credit card, you're sort of out of luck. Yeah, that's right. And, and moreover, I want to point out that. Credit cards were really not designed for the age of the internet. I mean, they were designed in the I don't know, was it the '60s or the '70s? But they were designed initially as you know something that you had a physical token, you could swipe it, you know, the data could be securely transferred. You know, now what we're doing is is crazy if you think about it. A credit card is a fundamentally a pull method of payment. When I want to make a payment to you, I give you all of my credentials. I give you this, this number that allows you to take whatever you want to take from me and I transmit that hopefully securely over the internet. I trust you to sec securely store that information. I, I trust you to you know, take the correct amount of money. Um, and yeah, it's, it's just crazy if you think about it. And Bitcoin flips that on its head and turns it into a push mechanism. If I want to pay you $100, I, you give me the destination address and that's all I need. I push the payment to you, and you have no further recourse to take any payment from me. And anybody who's watching the transaction can't get in the middle, and there's no fees. I mean, I think I think the uh, <laughs> I think you know I I don't necessarily know that the banks need to be uh, all that scared because payments is not a biggest source of, of revenue for banks. But Visa and Mastercard should be worried. That's an interesting point. You know, uh, it, and. I'm still trying to wrap my brain around this, actually. I don't know about, about how often you use Bitcoin in your life, but almost every time I do, I feel like I'm learning something new. But I, I was having fun the other day. I was at a, as a, at a camp in, in Canada, and I was kind of giving out little fractional pieces of Bitcoin to everybody. And I sent uh, t t twice as much as I wanted. I sent two transactions to one person, which sometimes happens. Like, yeah. you're not... You know, maybe the, 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 the wallet down or whatever. Yeah, and uh, and I said, listen, I sent you twice. I sent you two two uh, t two transactions. He said, well, can't you just take it back? And it's like, no, it's done. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's it's the equivalent of giving somebody a gold coin and they they run off. I mean, you, you That's can't. Right. You know, we you had can't. the same thing happen. We had the same thing happen at uh, at lunch at the Bitcoin conference. Somebody scanned a, a QR code as a request for payment, which happened to include an actual amount, which was different than the amount that they intended to send. Uh, and they didn't notice it. And, and of course, fortunately, everybody's friends. And yeah, and, and the apps will improve to the point that they'll anticipate human error. But right now, you do have to kind of be careful, don't you? But what, so what's interesting about this is that what at first seems to be maybe to a user like a maybe a disadvantage, like, okay, I sent you Bitcoin, I can't get it back now, it was a mistake, I can't get it back, is actually a gigantic advantage. I mean, it's like a revolutionary uh, reconception of, of how money works, right? Right. It means I, as the sender, am in control. I have to be careful, obviously, when I send you money, but, you know, I'm, I'm fully in control. You can't take money from me. I can give money to you. Um, but yeah, it, it brings control back to the individual, and without having to trust a bank or a, or a payment processor or, or so forth. Yeah, I, 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 when I realized that, I mean, there were se several stages of realization I went through. Yeah, I think I think I watched kind of your entire <laughs> process, sort of on the on the. Well, on the 
actually, I didn't care anything about it at all until I discovered it was it was scarce. And yeah. That, that blew me away, and so it's been one revelation. Well, let's talk about some of, the, some, of the, some of the cool new stuff that's going on these days. I mean, there's so many trends. I mean, in the first place, um, you know, I know we're not really supposed to care that much about the exchange rate, and it's going to go up, it's going to go down, and uh, serious Bitcoiners, you know, are like supposed to be indifferent to this nonsense. But I, uh, I don't know about you, but I do watch it, and I see some upward pressure uh, across all exchanges. Are you noticing that too? Yeah, absolutely, and, and I, I think um, more interestingly, and I, I don't know the cause of this, is that uh, the number of transactions is also uh, going up. I think we've seen all-time highs in the re in recent days in a uh, number of transactions, which excluding the popular addresses, which excludes things like Satoshi Dice and these gambling sites. Um, so I, I don't know what's driving that right now. Um, you know, you there's, know there's, there's something interesting about these the number of transactions, which... I don't know if you would if you would uh, identify that with um, velocity. Maybe there maybe there is a velocity of Bitcoin in some way, and this is in trans that number of transactions is a decent measure of that. But <clears throat> I remember talking to the BitPay people, uh, and the number of transactions that they were processing went through the roof mm -hmm. during the bubble of what was the April or whatever of, of mm -hmm. earlier this year, and then when the price fell again, then their number of transactions fell. Which mm -hmm. is an interesting thing because it's that's completely counterintuitive. If the Not value, I mean, I think I think that's well. There's there's a possible couple explanations for that. I mean, I think one of the one of the things is is wealth effect, right? I mean, I think that's you know traditional economists aren't wrong about everything. So uh, <laughs> the, you know, there's a thing called the wealth effect when you have when your your you know Bitcoin went from ten dollars to two hundred plus dollars. In the course of several months, suddenly people had, you know, a lot of Bitcoin. And they're like, maybe I should buy something. Um, that's so I think, I yeah. think you'll see that, and that's how it gets spread around, and that's how the, you know, sort of the initial concentration of an early holders will get spread out. But, um, you know, and I, and then I think also bit, you know, one of the things that that may have represented was just an alternate cash out mechanism. I mean, I think as opposed instead of dealing with exchanges, people may have wanted to say go buy gold from one of the gold dealers that accepts BitPay or Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that may have been kind of reflective. And that's just another form of, okay, the thing I own has gone up a lot. I want to diversify out of it. Um, and so that was I, that represented an alternate way to, to get out besides dealing with an exchange. Do you think that, that – um I also wondered, you know, there's been all these rumors about uh, problems in, in Greece, you know, that there's another bailout on the way and so on. I wondered if, if, if even the rumors of bad financial news might be starting to uh, influence the price. I think, uh, I think so far I, <laughs> I would pretty much make the contention that uh, macro-level news doesn't really impact Bitcoin because it's not big enough yet. Um, I think what you see is a lot of... When you had the um, uh, what was it, the, the Cyprus uh, bailouts, that ended up being an, a hook for news stories, essentially, because it, it, it happened concurrently with a large run-up in the Bitcoin price and inter you know large interest in Bitcoin, and these things can fuel each other once the news cycle gets going. Um, yeah. So you know, I think Bitcoin pretty much goes on its own on its own drum, which makes it interesting fundamentally. I think as, as an asset class that's not freaking correlated to anything out there. Yeah. Um, yeah. From a diversification perspective, I think, you know, you'd be crazy not to have, you know, half a percent or one percent of your your assets in something like Bitcoin. It's, it's funny the way people characterize, uh, because everybody pretends to be an expert, of course, and um, in, in March or whatever, um, or when, when the run-up started to happen, people said, well, look, Bitcoin, you know, it's just going to go up in value. That's all that's going to happen. And that was great. And then it crashed, right? Yeah. So then, then people said, well, the thing about Bitcoin is it's wildly, insanely volatile. <laughs> and and as, as soon as that became the conventional wisdom, it, like, stuck and froze at about, like, a right. hundred. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think, uh, you know, assuming things go right, the long-term trend is up, but we're gonna, I think we're going to see a lot more of, this, of that sort of volatility. You're going to see speculative bubbles where the – the speculation gets ahead of the true sort of uh, payment adoption, and 
Yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be a wild, wild ride. But um, well, t tell me, you you had mentioned before we talked about this some things you wanted to talk about. I'm just now staring at the page, but it looks like I'm not staring at you. <laughs> uh, yeah, let's, can we, we? Is it okay if we talk about uh, Satoshi Dice and uh, the emergence yeah. of that and 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 the sale? I mean, after all, we are talking about a rather successful uh, commercial venture that was entirely Bitcoin based that ended up changing hands, right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I don't know. You know, I don't know the full backstory uh, behind the sale. I certainly don't have any inside information into who the likely buyer was. Uh, there, you know, there have been some speculation that. Um, Eric could have actually bought it himself. He, he was already the majority shareholder. He may have wanted to remove outside shareholders. I don't know if that's true or not. Hmm. Uh, the uh, yeah, I think that was that represented. I mean, aside from the sale price, Satoshi Dice uh, generated you know a substantial amount of profit uh, that was distributed as dividends um, throughout its history. I think. Something on the order of uh, seventy to eighty thousand bitcoins, which of course varied in you know dollar value across the, that period quite quite heavily. But um, yeah, I think I think um, you know you saw at the end Satoshi Dice eliminated its access to the U.S. players, so that may have been a factor in precipitating. I don't remember that. Yeah, uh, the growth had kind of slowed as the Bitcoin price went up. The you know, the dollar amount wagered still continued to increase, but the amount of Bitcoin wagered dropped substantially. Um, and, you know, there, there were always uh, people, you know, there were always sort of multiple opinions about Satoshi Dice. You know, was it polluting the blockchain? You know, I, I'm of the opinion the blockchain is the blockchain. The rules are the rules. And if you're following the rules, paying your transaction fees, you know, that's that's the rules. And What, uh, what, was, the, what was the phrase you, you used? Bleeding the blockchain? Uh, sorry, bloating the blockchain. Because, bloating. <laughs> because, because of the way Satoshi Dice worked, every bet represented a transaction that had to be transmitted on the network and stored <laughs> in the blockchain forever. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's a little bit of crazy kind of way to make bets. But at the same time, uh, you know, if we can't scale past that level, then you know, Bitcoin is not going to go anywhere. Right. Anyway, so. Well, this is a dumb question, and, and we can pass by it really quickly. I'm not much of a gambler, so I don't maybe don't understand the yeah, whole maybe, thing. Maybe. Unless, unless I know I can win. Right? <laughs> okay, right. But so, do you know why people play played Satoshi Dice? The best think, for fun. I think it's the same reason they they play games in casinos. I mean, people. Some people like variance, and they like the you know the thrill of the win. The thrill of the win hurts. You know, is is more exciting than the. The loss hurts, I guess, or they, they think, well, yeah, I know I'm going to lose in the long run, but maybe just this one time I can I can make, you know make it win, and um, I, that's that's that gets into human psychology. And, uh, yeah, it's a little puzzle. It's, the whole thing is a little puzzling. First time I saw it, I thought, well, this is very strange. Uh, well, I remember uh, being at lunches. And people do a lot of weird stuff with Bitcoin. <clears throat> I was at lunch um, with some Bitcoiners in Vegas, and and the guy told me, I mean, this is a guy who's gainfully employed. Right, mm -hmm. a serious guy, yeah. and he spends his nights and weekends arbitraging on exchanges. Yeah, yeah, it's a uh, there's there's definitely arbitrage profit to be had there, but it's certainly not riskless. Uh, <laughs> definitely not a riskless profit given the history of Bitcoin exchanges. Um, right. You know, you, you've ha I don't probably half or more of the Bitcoin exchanges that have existed have like kind of gone out of business or. You know, sort of with varying levels of returning assets to customers. Um, you know, if you look at the market right now, you see there's been a persistent spread between Mt. Gox and the, you know, which has long been the primary exchange, and the the rest of the pack, Bitstamp, BTC, uh, and a number of other exchanges. There's there's been a you know fifteen dollar uh, spread at times, um, and that's you know, I think that's that's much more. Many many companies, including BitPay, have stopped using Mt. Gox as the primary price because it doesn't really represent what the true cost of a Bitcoin is. That has changed only in the last few days, right? I mean, I, I don't know about BitPay in particular, but I mean, a week ago, if you wanted to pull up any quoted 
uh, exchange rate, it would typically be about Gox. But just in the last few days, at least from what I can tell, yeah, I, think, it's I, think, I think the data services have been kind of slow to move off of Gox. But I think where you see actual money being money changing hands, that's been for some time. Like Coinbase has not been using the Mt. Gox price for their sort of fixed price sale and purchase for some time. Um, because because it's been it's become relatively impossible or extremely slow at least to get U.S. dollars out of Gox, um, and so what's really happened is that Gox it's not that bitcoins are worth more on Gox it's that their dollars are worth less. It's sort of you know uh, it's like is gold going up or is the dollar going down? Right, that sort of thing. So Coinbase is now using Bitstamp. Is that becoming the more and more the standard? Yeah, it's. I don't know if they use Bitstamp or a blend of kind of Bitstamp and some others, but it's. It seems to track uh, Bitstamp pretty well at the moment. Now, there's a topic I always avoid whenever I have these conversations with people. It's like, uh, you know, how you talk about Bitcoin to some people and they can't wait to stop talking about it because they're afraid they're going to say something stupid. Um, you know, if they don't know about it. Well, I feel that way about mining. So this is why okay. I don't often talk about it. So maybe you can help me out because in your notes to me, you said you were referred to the red hot hash rate growth. Right. Can you so, talk me about that? So I, I, I don't. What is your, sort of like? How much do you know about mining or how it operates? Or I, I, I know enough to kind of BS my way through lunch. Right. So I mean, as you know, mining essentially consists of transaction verification. It would be better called auditing. They're auditing the transactions on the network. And they're doing that by solving mathematical problems, uh, by making cryptographic hashes, SHA-256 hash. And we've reached, you know, we've gone through multiple eras of mining. We've gone through the CPU era, where people were just mining on their, their computers. And then people discovered that graphics cards were much more efficient, you know, right. 10 times more efficient. And that's, we sort of had the GPU era. And then you know, brief, there was kind of briefly a, a FPGA era, which was like a field field programmable gate array, uh, and that was kind of brief. That was it was always seen that the long term uh, end game would be what's called an ASIC, which is an application specific integrated circuit, and that's a chip that is essentially designed to do nothing other than SHA-256 hashing in service of Bitcoin mining. Right. And so we we've now seen. And when it comes to chips, there's, of course, multiple sort of generations of technology. Um, the initial ASICs that came out six months to a year ago were built on, I think, I don't know whether it's, I think it's something maybe maybe like 100 nanometer uh, process, which is probably, this is like maybe 10 years old in the semiconductor industry. You know, the current best chips are being done on something like a 22 nanometer uh, process, but of course those fabs are extremely expensive to to operate in. But you know we've now seen kind of like a 65 nanometer generation of chips come in, and we're now seeing multiple players who are um, doing 28 nanometer chips, which are kind of on the on the scale of so that I think the network today is on the order of four four or five hundred trillion hashes a second, so 400 terahashes a second. These new chips that are coming out, the 28 nanometer chips, are going to do half a terahash on a single chip. So, I mean, the, the hash rate has been increasing at something like 2.5%, 3% a day, which means, like, you're seeing a drop. Like, if you were mining uh, 10 bitcoins a, a week, you know, two weeks ago, suddenly the difficulty adjusts to the new hashing in the network, and suddenly you're earning like 40% less uh, because the hash rate is increasing so so fast. Uh, it's like kind of like a like a crazy arms race. And, and it is. It's a complete zero sum game. There's a, <laughs> there's an absolutely a fixed amount of bitcoins that come out of not of the earth but of the air, no matter how much. Power you you attach to it, so it's like it's like you know it's just like everybody. Fight. I think the best analogy is like you've you've got one milkshake and it's like how big is your straw? 
<laughs> well, well, why do people do it? I mean, I, because everybody thinks they can win. It's like why do people gamble too? You know, I, mean, okay, I, yeah. I think I think I think it's a little bit more complex than that. But uh, I think uh, people see the opportunity if they if they have the best technology, then they will have a serious competitive advantage for a period of time in which they can make you know quite a bit of profits actually. Because you know there's something on the order of four thousand bitcoins a day that are being produced, which is you know that's about almost half a million dollars a day. Yeah, you know that's starting to be you know real money. <laughs> you know, it, 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 Ben, it somewhat reminds me of the way Satoshi set it up. You know, by analogy, the gold mining, <clears throat> and it is kind of this way in the gold mining industry, right? I mean, it, it kind of is with difference though, because um, as the gold price goes up, you do actually get more gold out of the ground because more of the deposits are actually accessible because you, you can mine stuff at a higher price yeah. and it's profitable. Uh, and you can just sit on your gold reserves for a while until the price goes up high enough and then it's profitable to extract them. You can't just do that with Bitcoin because there's this fixed amount that's coming out no matter how much uh, power the network throws at it. So it's more like this milkshake's going down and like how fast can you drink it? Yeah, but there's, there's potentially more calories per sip, right? <laughs> I mean, with the price of Bitcoin going up, then you're rewarded more substantially. If That's you true, but you, I think to when you evaluate a mining investment, you always have to calculate the return on investment in Bitcoin terms because you, you have to ignore the price appreciation because you always have the option of, say, going into... Let's say you wanted to invest $5,000 in a mining operation. You, have, you today can go take that same $5,000 and buy bitcoins on the market. Now, if your Bitcoin, if the Bitcoin mining rig that you produce produces less than that amount of Bitcoin over the time of its useful life, then you've made a, a, a bad investment because it would have been more profitable to simply buy the Bitcoins. So, so you have to basically, I mean, what is the minimum amount of time you need to think ahead if you're going to do this stuff? Like 18 months, two years? <sighs> You know, at the, at the rate the hash rate is increasing, basically any mine, any mining equipment that's made today is essentially obsolete in like six to nine months. I mean, a year at the max. But it will produce. You know, the production curve is like extremely steep downwards. So like you produce basically probably eighty to ninety percent of what it will ever produce in its first few months. It's so interesting, uh, and yet people are de just dedicated to it. I thought about doing some of it myself so I could just at least talk about it more intelligently, but <clears throat> you've just about talked me out of it. <laughs> yeah, I, I really have. I, I, I dabbled with like a mining contract back in 2011 and saw how ra we were going through another rapid hash rate increase at that time, and sort of I saw how it rapidly sort of declined, and I was like, screw this, I'm just going to go buy some Bitcoin. Right, right. But tell me um, one, one last thing I wanted to ask you about, and um, it kind of taps into something that I've been thinking about uh, with Bitcoin. Um, and I know Satoshi thought about this when he first introduced it. Do you remember that there's, at least in the legend of Satoshi, that there was some talk about using his new invention for some advanced use, and he warned against it. He said, no, we're, we're not at that point yet. We need... I think it was. Uh, I think people wanted to use it to fund WikiLeaks. I That's think what that, it was, and he yeah. and he declined. He said, "Look, we're not ready for that yet, right?" It was, yeah, it wasn't because of technical concerns. It was because of the amount of political heat that I think it would have brought at that. Oh, is that what it is? Yeah, okay. the political heat that was was and, and is on WikiLeaks. Um, you know, now I think now it's fine. Of course, WikiLeaks accepts Bitcoin. There's plenty of political heat on Bitcoin itself now. So, like, we got to take it regardless. Um, but, but do you get do you get frustrated with the with the slow pace of development? I mean, anybody who uses Bitcoin can see so obviously that it's right. it's 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 a much better system. I mean, it would be good for the world economy, yeah. good for people's privacy, good for their own personal prosperity, uh, good for merchants because of lower transaction fees and so on and so on. Here you have such an obvious, obviously superior technology, and yet and and you know in the sweep of history. Things have gone rather quickly. This is a four-year-old yep. uh, technology, and yep. yet it's you know kind of this. I do I do get frustrated. I do get frustrated at times. I'm like, why doesn't this go faster? And I think um, 
yeah, like you just when you see when you can kind of visualize the end game, you know, but you don't know how long that end game might take to get. You're like, well, why doesn't everybody else just get it and get there? Why don't we get there sooner? But that's it's like the, the market way. has to kind of crank away, doesn't it? I yeah. mean, like like one unit at a time. Yeah, no, it has to happen. It, you know, really, how it spreads is person to person. It's ultimately about information spreading in human networks. And that's, you know, that's how everything spreads when it comes down to it. That's how Facebook spreads. That's how every new technology essentially comes down to, you know, person-to-person -person contact and, and you know, people finding a use for a technology. I mean, Bitcoin, you know, today, well, if you don't want to gamble on the Internet, you don't want to, like, possibly invest in something that is, is speculative, you know, maybe you're not finding you know, a use for it in your daily life, especially sort of the the, the uh, early majority who are, are a very sort of pragmatic uh, set of people. Um, they're just, if it helps their life, they'll use it. If not, they won't. But um, and there's also... Yeah, an I, th I, think, I, I think I'm, fr I'm simultaneously frustrated and then uh, excited about what actually is happening because I think when you see the news, you have slow new per news periods, but then... Uh, if you're actually a little bit connected to to what's going on in the Bitcoin community, there's like you know about startups that are sort of building, but they're not launched yet, and so you you can kind of get a sense that wow, there's like a surge building, and you know I think like you'll see over the next six months, well, you know there'll be a pickup in news activity again because there'll be more happening, there'll be more businesses launching, there'll be um, you know more clarity on regulatory fronts. And, and yeah. always, and always, uh, ever more reasons to uh, to, um, to to talk to you, Ben. I I really appreciate uh, visiting with you, and I look forward to our next visit. Absolutely, and uh, and I just want to touch on the fact that uh, I am that uh, I don't know you are a, a Bitcoin Foundation board member, or, or sorry, a, a, just a foundation member, or not? Yes, I'm a foundation member. Yes. Uh, so there's upcoming board elections. Um, uh, initially, I was reluctant to run for the, the open board seat, but uh, a bunch of friends uh, cajoled me into it, and so uh, I am actually now running. And uh, perfect. I you know, think I think that uh, uh, I would love to be involved with uh, helping steer the Bitcoin Foundation over the next couple of years. Well, this is this is really qualifies as public service in the old fashioned sense. There's <laughs> not a lot of glory that goes along. No, and it's, and it's using your extraordinary mind and experience and insight, you know, to, to the good of, of, a, of a wonderful technology. So um, I'm grateful to you for, for being willing to do this and, and I hope everything goes well for you. Absolutely. And maybe we'll uh, sync up in a few months and sort of catch up on what's going on in the Bitcoin world. Perfect. Thank you so much, Ben. Absolutely. Thank you, Jeff. Bye-bye. Right.